Sounds good. So welcome everybody. I see about 40 or so people are here, which is fantastic. Thank you for joining. Uh, it might be your morning or e evening, whatever time it is, wherever you're calling in from. Uh, we're happy to see you. And on that note, if you can type in the chat box your name and where you're calling from. Or I see someone said hello from Brazil, just so we get a Brazil. sense. Uh, Oh, cool. let's see what we got here. Portugal, Brazil, Germany, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, United States. Thank you, Taylor. Wow. El Salvador, Malta, Indonesia. Very cool. France, Spain, Fiji. Incredible. One of the things that makes Sustainable Ocean Alliance quite special is that we have people coming in from all over the world. We now have a global community spanning 165 countries and we come together for things like the Ocean Learning Labs. This particular Ocean Learning Labs is a series on plastics and circular economy. And this is the first, the inaugural episode of that series. Um, we are thrilled to have an incredible panel and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Ron Tardif, to provide a bit more about what we're getting ourselves into today. And uh, yeah, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be fun. And I really appreciate you all tuning in from, from all over the place. So Ron. Hello everyone. And I'm so glad to see such great turnout from our community uh, today. This panel is the first, it's the post-screening discussion, so we've got some fantastic experts. We even have one of the, the celebrities from the, from the documentary, Martin, here with us as well. You might recognize his face. Um, and so we're going to be discussing and diving into to the issues that come about in the story of plastic. And this series, uh, this is the kickoff to a series that will go until early November, which is curated by our guest curator and first of a kind, uh, Patty, who's one of our young ocean leaders and good friend of ours. Tarofsky uh, Foundation and really the around the world that um, maybe don't always get the, the attention uh, in the plastic, the discussion around ocean plastics. And we also have broken it down, the series, into different elements like research, circularity, cleanups, um, lifestyle change and we actually were starting with research and moving all the way ending with cleanups because we think that the the problem really begins with who we are as people uh, and the, the throwaway you know societies that we've constructed but we also do have the trash that you know ultimately ends up in the ocean and is there and we do need to clean that up too so we're gonna go from from that that very core issue of what's the problem how can we understand it? How do we change ourselves? And then, okay, well, you know, once we've changed ourselves, we still got to get rid of what's there. So let's do that. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing. The other element is the Ocean Action Lab, which is a first. So this is really a space for practitioners, people who are working on plastic. It may be organizing cleanups. It may be monetizing plastic through, a, through entrepreneurship. It may be about, you know, changing people's lifestyles and minimalism. Uh, these people will come together through our Action Lab in our mobilized community. We will do uh, special workshops diving into communications, issues of diversity in plastic and, and how marginalized peoples are affected, which is, is really something that we want to highlight and we want to elevate those marginalized voices in this series and in the Action Lab. Uh, and then hopefully we will also bring together some case studies and successes in a globally collaborative space um, so that we can make sure that we're, we're working uh, as efficiently as possible um, and as holistically as possible on this, this challenge. So without any more words from me, I'll pass it over to Patty, um, who uh, is debuting in, in her role as, as the curator. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for having joining us today. Uh, as Ron said already, we have an amazing uh, uh, expert panel. And I have the, I have the, I'm, I'm so lucky that I have been able to work with them in 
one uh, way or another, maybe just a little bit, or we have met uh, during conferences. And I would like to introduce you to Sirine Rashed, uh, Martin Burke, Danny Washington, and Yuyun Ismawati uh, from Nexus 3. And I will let them introduce themselves just uh, briefly, because I think that it's always better to, to hear it from, from, from them. Uh, Sirina, maybe, maybe you would like to start? Sure. Thank you, Patty, and hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening. Uh, so my name is Serene, and I work with the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. We are an NGO network uh, with about 800 groups in uh, over 90 countries, and we work on waste reduction with communities at the local level very often to reduce waste and in a way that promotes justice and also reduces toxic pollution. So um, I'll leave it at that for now, and I'll pass the bat on to uh, Danny. Thank you so much, Shireen. So I'm Danny Washington. I am born and raised here in the US, originally in Miami, Florida, but I have strong Caribbean roots uh, in my family heritage. And uh, I've gotten involved in ocean conservation from a very young age, uh, had a distinct passion for our blue planet since I was a child. And that led me to a career of first studying marine science and then transitioning into science communications, which I do today. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've worked as a television host and, and a science communicator, uh, hopefully translating the information that our brilliant scientists around the world are, are collecting and gathering uh, regarding the health of our planet and then bringing it to larger audiences and hopefully in influencing and encouraging more inclusion um, and conversations about you know, things that matter most to those, you know, different communities around the world that have traditionally been left out. So that's really my job. I'm also the co-founder of a nonprofit called Big Blue and You, which works to inspire and educate kids about the ocean through art and science. So thank you so much for having me. And it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Martin, would you like to continue? Sure. <laughs> my name is Martin Bork. I'm the executive director at the Ecology Center in Berkeley, California. Um, we started the first curbside recycling program in 1973 and continued to provide that service to the residents of Berkeley under contract with our municipal government. And uh, our vision has always been that recycling should reduce waste, create jobs, protect uh, ecosystems and the environment. And uh, we've stayed in that um, space as many, you know, most of the nonprofit recyclers uh, have been uh, either pushed out or handed over the reins to large garbage companies to, to run recycling programs. And we've stayed in it really to try and keep it true and, and honest and um, uh, with the um, use of recycling as an outlet for plastic pollution, uh, we've really um, been a voice to try and um, say what's real about plastic recycling, what's fake about it, and um, where we think the real solutions are in terms of preventing um, pollution from, from plastics. Um, Yuyun, would you like to jump in? Yes, sure. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this, um, this uh, call and webinar. Uh, I'm Yuyun Ismawati. Um, I was born in Indonesia. Uh, in the last 10 years, I live in the UK. Uh, I work for my own NGO in Indonesia called Nexus 3 Foundation, Nexus for Health, Environment and Development, formerly known as Bali Focus because I established it in Bali. Um, but uh, after a period of time, our work is expanded nationwide, regionally and globally. Uh, I'm affiliated to, uh, we are affiliated also to um, a global network called IPEN, International Pollutant Elimination Network, where I was also one, I'm, I'm also one of the steering committee member. Um, IPEN is a global network of 600 or more NGOs in 123 countries. Um, we work towards a toxic free future. Um, we work to translate the local challenges, uh, local problems uh, to global, uh, which consider as global challenges and translate it back. So most of our work is trying to translate the local problem to the regional and global, national and global level, and also vice versa. So any conventions, agreements uh, done at the global level, 
we also try to bring it home and, and translate it at the local and national level. So we work with uh, all stakeholders. Um, I, use, I, I can call myself as a researcher, activist, entrepreneur. So yeah, we can talk about it later. Great, thank you very much everyone for, for making, letting, letting you know a little bit um, more. And as Ron said in the beginning, uh, these labs are aiming to break through a little bit the noise of the mainstream media or the information that we mainly found in social media and to debunk these myths and misconceptions and also to listen and learn from, the, from many, as many voices as, as possible to, to gather and to create um, a better knowledge for a better future. And we would like to talk about uh, four main points during, during our, our lab today, our webinar, and it's, I would like to talk about recycling, communication, health, and what are the solutions that we can, uh, we can uh, thrive for. And I, as we have seen in the story of plastic do documentary, we have seen uh, that recycling system is not working as good as we have been told through the decades, right? But how, how it's actually uh, the globalized uh, recycling system working and what are the actual limits to it? Um, I, I met uh, Martin uh, two years ago and I heard about his story two years before in a podcast and I was so struck uh, by his experience that I'm like, he's one of my reference person. I have always him on, on my mind on this time. And I have worked myself on the transboundary movement of plastic waste. And, and I would like Martin, if, if you don't mind, uh, him telling you a little bit the story of, of what he found in the very beginning, all like, way before that this, the Chinese law said that there is no more plastic coming in, plastic waste coming into our, into our country. And yeah, I, I wouldn't say more. Uh, please, Martin, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you know, I'll just give a, a quick history because, you know, it's a long trajectory uh, in, the, in the 80s and before there really wasn't that much plastic packaging. It was um, too expensive really a material and it was reserved for durable goods. Um, but in the 80s, the bottling industry switched from glass to plastic and that was a major transition. And we fought that in California because in California we had a refillable bottle program where those bottles would, um, for beverages would be collected and refilled. And they switched to a disposable model and that was really the beginning of plastic recycling. Um, where instead of refilling bottles and reusing them over and over and recycling the glass when it got broken or old, um, they went to a linear model where you, know, you, you put the beverage in the bottle and then you can ship it anywhere in the world. You can scale up your facility. So it was really part of globalization um, and exp you know, expansion and scaling up of the beverage industry. And um, I, I bring that up, it's ancient history maybe, but um, it really set the foundation for why we have so much plastic pollution is most of it is, is packaging. About half of the plastic made in, in the world is, is made for packaging and that's the fastest growing sector of the plastic industry. And um, after bottles went, then we started to see every kind of other type of packaging um, move towards uh, uh, plastic. And um, it's, you know, obviously it's very cheap, it's subsidized, um, it's durable, it's very moldable, you can make it into whatever you want. So it's a marketer's dream, it's a packager's dream, it's a brand manager's dream, it's a merchandiser's dream, uh, it works great in retail spaces. So like everybody in the middle loves plastic and people on the ends of the life cycle of plastic hate it. You know, the people at the wellheads, at the frontline communities in the petrochemical industry, you know they're getting poisoned by it, and then it's getting dumped on um, countries around around the globe and in the ocean and in our environment. And, you know, and as recyclers, we feel we're, it's getting dumped on us as well. Um, there are really two types of plastics today that have um, reasonably stable and viable markets. Uh, those are bottles, both of them. Number one, the clear plastic PET bottles, and number two, the opaque uh, jugs, um, 
you know, for um, detergents and shampoo and, and milk jugs and that, that sort of stuff. Um, both of them primarily are downcycled into um, other products and not in a circuit, you know, not used in a circular way. So, um, you know, we try and put the cycle back in recycling. That's what we're um, really focusing on right now and getting, if there's going to be plastic recycling, it should be bottle to bottle recycling. It should be circular in its nature, not this, you know, so-called advanced recycling or chemical recycling where it's taking plastic and using it for packaging and then burning it as fuel or, or turning into diesel or something. That's very linear. It's not recycling. Um, and the rest of the, the um, plastic packaging, which is tens of thousands of different um, formulations and products and packages that are extremely difficult to sort out and separate. Um, the rest of that stuff, you know, has very marginal markets, is used in very marginal ways, and um, most of it gets thrown away. So our story was, we didn't want to collect all that stuff for years. We pushed back against it. Um, the American Chemistry Council and the plastics industry was pushing it on cities, saying you should recycle it all, collect it all, um, knowing full well that there were no markets for this stuff something that they're doing currently with plastic pouches and um, beware that is going to be the next wave of non-recyclable stuff that they're going to tell people to put in the blue bin is those pouches um, and we fought back against that um, eventually our city caved into the pressure and said well there's you know some markets in china you should collect it and ship it there and um, we fought back against that and and eventually um, because we couldn't see where the plastic was going and we were very concerned because of our partners internationally through the global alliance for incinerator alternatives through the break free from plastic movement and through uh recently at that time released film plastic china we were very concerned about the plastic being dumped and burned um, and you know maybe they pick out some of the best stuff that they could sell but the rest of it um, causing you know harm to the land air sea drinking water um, et cetera, and uh, polluting communities. And um, we put some GPS trackers into some of those grades of plastics to see where they went, and our greatest fears were indeed confirmed. Um, it was pretty horrific. Um, wastewater from marginal sort of um, informal sector recycling plants um, that would wash the plastic. We're just dumping that wastewater. It's full of food, shampoo, um, maybe pesticides, maybe motor oil, um, all of that getting washed right into the local um, surface water, the creeks and streams um, that people downstream use for washing and maybe drinking. Um, and then um, residuals being dumped nearby in the fields, um, that degrading into the soil and was incorporated into agricultural land. So um, I can't imagine that's good for the crops or people who eat them. Um, and then, you know, the residual from that when it rains filters down into the drinking water and, and the uh, groundwater, really problematic. Um, and a lot of it was dumped in canyons. And then when the uh, monsoons come, it's washed into the creeks <clears throat> and streams and rivers, eventually out to the oceans. Mm -hmm. And then China was being blamed as, you know, the big pollutant yeah. um, while taking massive amounts of, of uh, uh, imports from, from developed nations. So, um, that's our story. We stopped uh, exporting that stuff. Currently, yeah. we send it to a facility in Southern California where it's sorted um, with uh, optical sorters and robots and artificial intelligence at great yeah. expense. And still half of it goes to landfill. So, so you have to ask, is it really recyclable? No, exactly, exactly. And and to me, and, and as, as Zoe Carpenter says in, in the documentary, uh, we don't hear about this uh, these things, right? Because the attention of, of the media for decades has been, uh, the communication on the media has been directed to the wrong side of the story. Um, but I, I would like to know, like, how, how can we communicate uh, all what is really happening and who is getting um, the most affected and how we people that we don't think that we are contributing so much, mm -hmm. uh, how can we communicate uh, all these messages to to the right people. Uh, Danny, will you mind to, to take, because I know that you have to leave us soon. Will you mind to, to jump right in on this one? 
Absolutely. My pleasure. So, uh, you know, I think with the story of plastic as a documentary, I was blown away after I watched the film because for the first time it felt as though I could see in a succinct way, the full picture, the big picture of what plastic truly is in our society and from start to finish. And I thought that it was brilliantly done, but many of the people that I spoke to afterward that are not a part of our community, that are not aware of these bigger issues, when I spoke to them after they watched it, they all felt pretty um, discouraged. And that's unfortunately the, the result of many documentaries that cover this topic. We are looking at a very overwhelming and depressing issue um, in addition to everything else going on in our society. But that doesn't mean we have to continue in this, on this road of despair. That's where communications come in. That's where the media comes in. And I'm grateful that we are transitioning from just the information age into this like just fully connected age where uh, a 15 second video on TikTok could change the world. That to me is so powerful. And what I wanna say and what I hope that those who are listening today will leave away with is that we all have the power, especially in communities like SOA to create and craft these stories. Now, when, when talking about these stories, I think it's twofold. So we can talk about the action items, the calls to action. What are the things that you can do on the daily um, in your own individual life? But more importantly, I think it's about communicating the disparity of those who are oppressed by this, this material and the process of making this material and disposing of it. So I think as a whole, we can definitely do a better job of crafting a collective story that puts those oppressed at the forefront so we can hear their voices and know what they're going through and the impacts on their lives. So we can see a direct link, the human link, because that ultimately will be the only thing that will inspire those to take action that ha are not in that position. And so the oppressed voices need to be the loudest in the room, hands down. And I think it's also about, you know, creating systemic and transformative change. So looking at how we're going to alter these policies, not just standing in solidarity, but also doing something about it and within the systems that are there. So I, I'm grateful that, you know, we have so many options on platforms like uh, everything from linear television to Facebook to YouTube to TikTok. There are all these places where we can send out these messages. And so I hope that everyone here feels encouraged to do so. Um, and if you don't want to be that person in front of the camera, kind of like what I do for my daily job, I, I work on television shows that are syndicated out to millions of people across the US that's okay. You don't have to necessarily be the one in front of the camera. You can be the one writing those stories, um, galvanizing those in the community to, to have a collective message that is succinct and, and easy to, to understand so that we can get that information to the communicators that are out there, even if they're not a part of this community. Uh, so I, I really just hope everyone uh, feels, feels that deeply because we're at such a critical juncture in time that we have this, this very slim chance, this opportunity, this door to communicate this message effectively. Um, but we just need to be all, all need to be on the same page in order to do that um, for those of us who are aware of the issues. Definitely, definitely. And, and we, are, we are very lucky to have so people that are so committed and knows actually how to communicate very complex uh, messages to in a simple way. So not everyone who is a researcher or is in academia can understand what is happening but like to put the words to yeah like to have to have the message in a more understandable way so everyone can do something and not just like get bored about the uh, mess like I don't, I don't know how to say it right now like the all the the noise it's, it's very yeah the noise it's 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 not an easy it's a very complex uh, a problem. So it's good to have someone channeling all this information to a very um, easy way to understand so we can do things and not just talk about them, but do something and take action too. So thank you very much for your participation, Danny. I don't know if you have to leave right now or you, you can stay a few more minutes, um, but you are free to do whatever you, you want to do right now. Uh, thank you, Patty. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, again, a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to watching the rest of the conversation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, and have a, have a very nice day. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. <laughs> um, I would like to, to go back to what Martin was saying about 
like once uh, the plastic is ship is shipped to uh, countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, or it was before to to China, uh, he found out that all this plastic end up most of the time in the backyards of people, and he even mentioned as and also as we saw in the in the documentary that people were using this plastic or the the little ash um, in of, of the incineration of plastic into crops and that he said that that couldn't be good i would like to know more about about that like how how incineration it's actually happening it is is that a good solution for for us and and what is the situation in um what is the situation in indonesia for example like do we do we have like very specialized places where plastic is burned in a safe way? Yuyun, what what do you what do you see? Uh, you said that you were from Indonesia originally. How what do you see in in happening in Indonesia? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Patty. Uh, I'm sorry. Sometimes my microphone will be off and on and off, uh, so I have to click cancel and so on and so on. So. It's a bit technical problem. Um, yes, uh, I was actually part of the the survey team before they filming it, um, but I couldn't come when they filmed the the, um, the story of stuff in Indonesia. Sorry, the story of plastic in Indonesia. Um, yeah, but I, I I know, and I went to that places in the film also several times um, over a couple of years. Um, we've been watching this problem since 2016 when we started learning um, during the, uh, the establishment of Greg Free from Plastic in Tagai Thai uh, and also sharing the information, uh, shared the information from uh, our colleagues in China that uh, there is a new development of China's policy and so on and so on. So we started watching the, 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 the traffic of waste and the movement of waste to Indonesia from various countries and we've seen uh, a jumping off um, plastic waste in several uh, uh, clusters in Indonesia, in near Jakarta, around Jakarta, there are lots of um, uh, locations of uh, plastic waste importation um, companies and also the dumping sites. Um, the one in East Jaffa are mostly actually came from uh, paper scrap importations uh, imported by 12 companies in East Java, but uh, for some reasons they inserted and smuggled some of the plastic waste between paper paper waste uh, and because we have very weak um, system in monitoring uh, stuff and goods that coming in and out from Indonesia um, and the, I think we the government also received very um, small intelligence but maybe they not also responding quickly to the development in the region so as a result we seen a lot of plastic waste coming into Indonesia maybe triple um, four times than than usual and our colleagues in uh, in East Jaffa especially Ekoton uh, Prigi and his uh, uh, his colleagues also um, visited several hotspots and when he brought me there I said um, this is ridiculous because the community used it for anything and farmers converted to become plastic farms so farmers uh, and then they use it also to make tofu uh, and last year we collected some samples of eggs from uh, sorry hang on my my microphone is okay is it back now yes okay um um so because because we we saw the situation in the field um with uh very thick smokes from morning until evening uh because the communities burn the plastics in the tofu factory and also in an opening in in, in the open space in a dumping sites because they cannot uh, utilize the small tiny um, packagings and all the um, the broken uh, torn apart uh, packaging um, as a result we released a report last year in October we found um, dioxins in eggs um, in chicken eggs that 
almost the same as high as um, dioxin level in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. So can you imagine the Vietnam War is intentionally sprayed by Agent Orange, but in Indonesia, it's an intentional burning of plastic and it has the same level of dioxins. And if you don't know yet, dioxins is the most carcinogenic um, uh, persistent organic pollutants, they call it, um, regulated under the Stockholm Convention. And countries have, uh, have, been, have agreed to, to eliminate the sources of dioxins, which is, uh, exist in plastics, PVCs, and, and, and many other uh, chlor chlorinated uh, stuff. Um, so we, we collected more samples of eggs and then soil uh, ashes uh, from central, uh, from East Java and also near Jakarta. We are going to release the, the report uh, next month. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same shocking story because um, in developing countries, uh, we, we don't have uh, sufficient laboratories to analyze certain chemicals. So if we say that, oh, this is dangerous, that dangerous, you know, this chemical is dangerous. And then in, in, the, in the developing countries, we cannot prove it because there is no laboratory. And sometimes, um, sometimes my government, uh, the Indonesian government doubted our report and, and the results of our, our research because they cannot compare our results, which was analyzed in European laboratories because there is no facility in Indonesia. So when we say, it's dangerous to burn plastics because it releases certain chemicals, POPs and then uh, PFAS and whatever, you know, all the, the harmful chemicals. Uh, in reality, it's, it's a bit difficult to prove it to people because we cannot test it every day. It's Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's good, okay. It's good already. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so what we can do is that because from several samples, um, we, we learn that we compare it also with other countries like uh, from Ghana, from uh, the Philippines, from Vietnam, and, and from other countries where waste being burned, including in Europe, even in Europe, um, if you burn um, plastic or waste in, um, in a uh, proper way, for instance, in the incinerator plant, or waste to energy plants using other kind of technology. Sirin will be able to explain this further. Um, it's still there are lots of toxics, um, toxic chemicals formed because of the new process of the heating process and so on, which most papers only look at one or two parameters. There is no, there is no experience. It's a different compositions will create different uh, mixture. And it's not easy to prove and see it. Um, so to see further the, the, the impact of, of those um, chemicals released as the results from burning plastic and burning waste, uh, there are lots of studies in Europe, especially, and in the US, showing uh, the impact uh, um, to human health, especially uh, carcinoma, uh, cancer cases and non-communicable diseases. Uh, we are all worried about COVID yeah. at the moment because it's very, you know, easily spread out, but actually there is a hidden diseases, which we call it non-communicable diseases, that created by uh, chemicals that we use and burn, especially. Yeah. So yeah, to prevent that from happening, it's better to know what's going on and follow all the the new science and then new reports because. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I have to say that I. I read just a month ago the report that you're saying and through my five years or six years career sometimes like you get kind of sedate of like all the information that you are receiving and sometimes you see things and you you stop like like feeling anything but then so often you get a story and you get proof of what is happening that completely shake your core. And, and that was for me, your report. I have to say that I read a line that I have to stop, cry, and then go back to work. And that was a moment where you, like you and your colleagues said that the plastic arriving to Indonesia 
that is sell that is profitable and sold as a recycling for uh, companies that recycling that recycle. They do some some sorting, right? And they take the, the plastic that is good for them, as uh, Martin has mentioned before about the pet bottles of the pack for uh, the detergent and, 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 yeah, and the shampoos gems. bottle and everything. And then the film that you are talking about that is not profitable, mm. they either sell it very cheaply or the companies, and this is the part that it shocked me they give it away to small communities as donation as part of their development programs community There's, development yeah the, the community yeah the, the, the developing the developing the community, community program. development yeah program. yeah sorry <laughs> uh, that part i there's so many layers to those two lines that are so heartbreaking and i think mm. that we need to know we as the public and learning about this and more people from the global north need to know that it's not yeah. that we are just importing our waste is what people like in the end point is is suffering and yeah i i'm very i'm very happy that even though you get so so much pushback uh from your work sometimes you keep going because this piece of information is just incredibly important for the rest of the world to know and I yeah. think that it's, this is the kind of information that is not on social media or in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if you would like to add more or we can go to Serene. Yeah, I, I just want to add a little bit. Yes, please, um, please. So uh, this is strongly related to um, the Global North uh, habit of, of uh, separation uh, at home or at source. So what you do in the Global North is not recycling. It's not. You're just separating the waste. You're not recycling yet because you don't know where, where your stuff will be ended up. And I live in the UK. I feel guilty. Every time I bought packaging and so on, I always said to my husband, okay, this packaging will go to Vietnam. This packaging will go to Indonesia. <laughs> this packaging will go to Turkey, you know, because I know there are lots of illegal uh, exportation also from the UK. And uh, I know what's the name of the company and so on. And then I know where they send it to. Um, so I think it's, it's also a, a matter of um, our discipline at home uh, that you have to read all the packagings, whether this packaging is... Oh, again. Are, yeah, because some of them are with the sign currently not recycled, you know, currently not recycle or check your, your recycling curb because I found that kind of packaging ended up in Indonesia and in, in an open space where the community just burn it because no one wants wants that 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 that, that products. Yeah. yeah. So um Sirina, I if like I would love to to know more if you want to to add something to what you is saying. Uh, but I believe that today I read something from Gaia saying that we are moving like the industry keep going, keep on going with the with the COVID pandemic, creating more and more single-use plastic, which eventually is going to become a real, real, and I don't even know how to say like the extension of the problems that this could be causing uh, in in the endpoint, as we're saying, Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, but like, yeah, like what do you, what do you think that due to COVID, what can happen with all our single use plastic plus like the trend of incinerating uh, our plastic because we think that that's a better way of dealing with it because it magically disappears right yeah thank you and um if it's if it's all right i will respond to some of the points that were made earlier um perfect perfect so <laughs> as you said you know incineration the seduction of incineration is to make you believe that it takes a problem, which is waste, and it magically makes it disappear with a big shiny machine that might be a little bit expensive, but hey, since waste is such a complicated problem and it's gross anyways, isn't it great that we can just make it disappear, right? And maybe on the top, you might get some energy or some, some electricity or some heat. So, you know, it's all benefits. Why would you ever criticize it? So the reason that incineration doesn't work is that this is a lie. 
what actually happens. And you know this because you know what happens when you burn something. You transform a, a, a material into some heat, but also ash and fumes, toxic emissions. And for incineration, we're talking about about up to 40% of ash, which is toxic. We're talking about significant carbon emissions and the more plastic in your waste, the higher the carbon emissions. We're in a climate emergency. This is not a neutral fact. And we're talking about toxic pollution. And as you said, uh, as Yu Yun said, non-communicable disease is the silent epidemic. Uh, in the EU, the latest figures, 400,000 deaths per year due to air pollution. And that's the EU with, you know, on average, perhaps uh, higher than, you know, better medical care than you might get in other places, but still, even in the EU, 400,000 deaths a year. So uh, coming back to maybe responding to a, a couple of points, um, Danny made a great point about communication and, and about telling the stories, why the role of maybe the, the role that we can play as a community to communicate about plastic pollution uh, is to tell the stories of the people at different parts of the life cycle. Uh, there was a webinar uh, earlier this year uh, organized by Oxford University with some high fly academics who are, have a big plastics project. And the lead academic on that was talking all about, you know, uh, recycling is the best thing you can do and bioplastics is the way to go. And they didn't talk about reduction. And when we wrote to them to ask them why and to challenge them on that, they said they, you know, they, 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 um, or that, that academic in particular was very defensive. And he said, well, you know, the real problem that faces, that humanity faces, the real problem, the real concern, the top concern is we all want to be immortal. You know, that's like our priority concern is attaining immortality, literally. I'm not joking. And therefore, since plastics, save time because they're convenient therefore they have value and and basically just with that statement you know basically plastic saves my time as a white male therefore it is valuable regardless of the impacts on all other communities around the world and regardless about of the ways that it amplifies and deepens racial inequalities socioeconomic inequalities colonialism therefore I, I was just amazed. And it made me realize that that communication, we need to do it also in academia, including in the most elite places like Oxford University and other, and other institutions. And I think Patty, you have a reaction? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was going to say like, I couldn't agree more with you because I'm actually looking for funding for doing a PhD exactly on that same topic. So hopefully <laughs> uh, soon the money comes and, and we can keep researching, but I, Thank you so much for, for that answer, because that is right in the center of, 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 of what we need to keep researching on. And also, I would like to know, would you mind to send us the link of that um, podcast that podcast or report that you're talking about so all of our audience can, can know more about it? Sure, I'll, I'll send them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put some links in the chat and I'll, and I'll send okay. some. Okay, thank you very much. Them. Thank sure. you very much. Sorry. And yeah. yeah, is there something else that you would like to share with us? Yeah, sure. Maybe coming back on the question of, you know, whether recycling works and how much, how much the recycling industry today, despite the fact that we have some really important recyclers recycling the kinds of plastic that Martin was talking about, PET and HDP, near the places where these, these, these wastes are being uh, produced, th that exists. But for all the other plastics, we are structurally dependent on dumping these plastics in the global south and the proof of that is that when there was an initiative to regulate these plastic wastes under the Basel Convention the American Chemistry Council supported by the US government tried really aggressively to sabotage these measures and we weren't talking about plastics that is going to you know plastics that are that are clean and actually ready for recycling we were talking about the, the rest of the stuff the mixed the flexible the composite the dirty and even then, they were pushing back really aggressively because they know that if you remove these, these exports, if you remove that dumping, then, you know, the reality appears that the only way is to reduce. And then where we really need single-use plastics for some maybe essential niche applications to focus on the types we know how to recycle, to design them properly, et cetera. Um, 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Serene. Martin, would you like to contribute with anything that uh, Serene, uh, Serene has said? Because she has mentioned, again, like the role of, of recyclers and, and, and how, how we should go forward. And maybe we can also, like one, one of the questions from the audience, I think that can be, it's related to this. And, and maybe we can start uh, answering some of the questions. And, and this one, I think that it's, it's really um, have to do with this topic and is how can we push the stakeholders to do something about um, everything we're talking here? How can we make actions uh, be real? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the fundamental thing about plastic and recycling is that most of it isn't recyclable and most of it isn't recycled. So there's a huge myth that's been perpetrated around that for, for 20 years or more now. And they've spent millions of dollars and, and um, per, you know, trying to convince everybody that this stuff is magically recycled and, and you know, it's not a problem that recycling can fix. We can't recycle our way out of it. Um, and so I think just starting with really being clear about the communications around what is recycling, what is considered recycling, What's ethical recycling and what isn't recycling at all, which is most of it. And so, um, you know, by the, the, the packagers and the brands and the retailers and the petrochemical industry and the fossil fuel industry have all joined forces to, to you know, and the garbage companies to a certain degree to com convince us that it's all good, you know, that this is good packaging and it should just go in the blue bin and, and you can feel great about it. Consumers don't feel great about it when they find out what's really happening. And so that is one of the greatest leverage points in, in the communications part um, you know, of that 15 second TikTok video that Danny was talking about is that there is tremendous pressure right now on consumer brands from consumers directly through platforms like TikTok or um, Twitter. And um, they're paying attention um, at least to some degree. And, um, you know, they see this as a marketing problem. They see it as a perception problem. They do not see it as fundamentally their problem. They see it as a consumer, you know, consumers are dirty and they're littering. Um, that's how they, or at least that's how they frame the, you know, the solutions is, you know, let's create more recycling infrastructure. Let's put in more optical sorters, you know, let's build more infrastructure internationally. Um, but, you know, you're talking about trying to, to um, collect and put things through a pipeline, and then they call the pipeline leaky. They talk about leakage, you know, where the, you can't fit this stuff in a pipe. You know, it's, it may have come out of a pipe, but you can't put it back in one. And um, so, you know, the, not, the global brand audits are really important. Um, this is something that Break Free from Plastic and, and Gaia have really championed to, you know, we do shoreline cleanup here in Berkeley four times a year. And it's like, oh, let's do another shoreline cleanup and pick up all the trash again, you know? And when are we gonna stop doing that and say, hey, you guys, look, your crap is all over our, our shoreline and in our bay and in our ocean. You come clean it up or you pay to clean it up and not have all these volunteers out here. So the brand audits take that um, cleanup and they turn it into powerful information that you can act on it. So. Um, participating in the in the global brand audits are important. You can check that out at the Break Free from Plastic website. It's just breakfreefromplastic.org. Um, and um, that, you know, the report that came out recently showed the bottlers were the biggest polluters um, in terms of numbers. And they don't want to be, you know, who wants to be top of the global polluter list? Um, it's Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, <laughs> Dr. Pepper, Keurig, you know. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, that's, a, that's an important way to take local action and aggregate it into something that's very actionable and usable at the, at the global level. And then, you know, okay, Nestle, Coke, and Pepsi, you say you want to recycle 100% of your bottles. Great. How about a national bottle deposit system that actually gets those bottles back? How about minimum recycling content standards so that we're putting the cycle back and recycling and that those bottles are actually being made from plastic again. 
um, you know, we have to hold them in the policy arena um, to their words of what their intentions are. And, um, you know, we've seen a lot of voluntary um, intent, you know, com commitments made by these brands. They've never followed through on them. And so to hear, you know, this whole new wave of voluntary, you know, Coke's going to do this, Pepsi's going to do that, Nestle's going to do this. Let's, you know, I think the time for voluntary commitments is over and what we really need are mandatory regulations and enforcement. And, um, you know, that it goes to, like, yeah, I was just going like, to say that's true for the export grades as well. Like what is going on where people are either not taking the plastic out of the paper or actually maybe even blending plastic into their paper and exporting it as paper to a country like Indonesia, whose paper mills were never built to deal with post-consumer paper to begin with. Those were made, sadly, to grind up tropical hardwood into paper. But, yeah. but you know, that's not, you know, there needs to be some standards and some accountability. And um, right now it's, kind of you know a wild west environment of whatever you can get away with something that maybe uh people among our audience that don't know because it's not shared so much is that plastic pollution and plastic waste trade it really in most cases or in many cases are illegal trade and it's run by mafias uh, so it's it's not such a such an easy topic to to solve and I think that that um, that comes a little bit as well with uh, the final question that I would like to to ask and it's something that one of our attendees are are saying about air pollution lack of data um, and how different is all these things among different countries and how maybe solutions should be more local and and yeah like plastic waste plastic pollution and climate change and yeah, what we we were saying before uh, in the back is that uh, now there are so many fires in the U.S. Like all of this is keep counting for including pollution and CO2 and methane and all of these things to climate change. Like why don't we take things in, into our hands in each country? Or maybe I'm wrong, what do you think? Anyone? <laughs> I, I don't want to take up too much airtime here, but I will just say stack that on top of already um, disproportionate and oppressive health regimes where you've got, um, you know, people closest to the freeways, black and brown communities having disproportionate exactly. and much higher asthma rates to begin or COPD to begin with or being exposed to COVID because they're essential workers or because they're living in fence line communities already choking on the smoke of the plant. And then you've got on top of that, um, the smoke and the heat. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really stacking, um, you know, these, these oppressive factors and disproportionate impacts on, on communities who are least prepared Definitely. and least able to deal with it. Definitely. Uh, Yujung, would you like to, to include something? Yeah. Um, and in Indonesia also, the, uh, in the area where these companies importing plastic and paper waste, the communities around that area uh, also um, have an increased cases of uh, upper resp respiratory uh, problems. Uh, we went to several uh, health clinics around that area and, and check with them, ask with them whether they've seen an increased number of patients. And they said, yes, As in the last uh, two years, they said there is an increased number of young people, um, children, uh, and also old people um, with a respiratory problem. Uh, some of them willing to testify, uh, some of them are not because they were afraid of the thugs that uh, threatened them, especially if they talk to the media and then the thug the next day will come and, and shut them up. Um, we've been followed also by the thugs, so by the way, when, when we did some filmings with the PBS and so on. Um, but um, another thing is that uh, about injustice and also... Um, and just in terms of finance, because petrochemical industry are heavily subsidized by government. Um, in Indonesia, uh, petrochemical industry also have holiday tax, tax holidays for 20 years. So it means they can still produce 
whatever they want and um, all the responsibilities uh, done to the public sector and the company and, and the and the companies just wash their hand because they they have tax holidays for 20 years so tax holiday like they don't have yeah, they, to they yeah. don't have to yeah okay because they are big industry and they promise to the government that oh we invested millions of of dollars you know to 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 establish this factory and then employ maybe 5000 to 10000 workers uh, so they ask for tax holidays so and and then yeah sorry <laughs> and no, then fine. um regarding the importation of plastics in indonesia um we generated about 9 million tons of plastic waste every year and up to 20, 2016, we have data only until 2016, 2017, only 9 to 11% of that plastic waste being recycled. And still we imported about 400,000 until 1 million tons of plastic waste. Why? Because there is a mafia that you said before. Um, Indonesian importers got paid by the traders to receive X amount of company, X, X amount of containers. In Indonesia, we have the quota. Every company that importing um, uh, waste, they have quota to import X numbers of containers per year. But the extra containers, they receive money from the traders. The problem comes when the government confiscated the containers. They cannot return it to senders because they got paid. And this kind of information that traders bribe and so on and so on, also taking place in Africa. Last week we had a side event at Basel Convention. The delegates from South Africa said that we got bribed to receive containers. So it's 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 the game of the, the traders, you know, sending out stuff to here and there because some people benefit in between. But the communities at the end of the line, it, they got sick. And who, who, who should pay? If they cannot pay, it's the same system um, in Indonesia also. Some bas basic health services are free, but above that line, people have to pay. So if the community do not have money, how can they uh, get health services? So, but the, the producers, they got tax holidays. It's a crazy system we have. I had no idea about that. Um... Once again, thank you very much. I think that Ron wants to say something. Ron? Yeah, I just want to step in and say that we are at the hour. Um, and so I just want to thank everybody who has to jump, you know, at the hour for their attendance. The, you know, this has been really wonderful. I think we've gotten to such substance here and things that, you know, I, I never knew. And, you know, the oceans is my life as well. And so this has been really, really awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, and then with that, maybe Patty, you can ask everybody to close, say some, maybe a final takeaway. Um, yeah, I was, and... yeah, thank you. I was going to say that, but also say to, to our youth leaders that are listening to us and have written questions in, into the QA that we are very sorry that we couldn't take them, but I will make sure to write down answers for them and share it into our library that we will be making, right? And we will be asking them in the in the next uh, uh, webinar. So, yeah, uh, Sirine, Martin, Yuyun, could you please just say a few uh, words and give us a bit of hope to keep yeah. fighting for what we deserve? Yeah, I just wanted to say we've talked a lot of doom and gloom today, and the film certainly clarifies, you know, the problem as being a, a producer and systemic problem, not a consumer focus problem and, and I think that's where our attention needs to go. I've been in the environmental movement for um, all my career, over 30 years, and I've never seen an issue move as fast and have as many um, um, solutions put on the table, both good and, and bad, but um, really some amazing uh, proposals that have come out um, uh, to address this problem. So uh, it's one of the more, um, you know, massive and depressing issues, but it's also one of the more hopeful ones where we're actually seeing a lot of, of change happening at a very you know, fast pace. So I would just say, uh, keep the pressure on, 
that's what's moving this thing so fast. And, and that's something everyone can contribute to. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, Yu Yes. Um, what I would like to say to uh, especially young people is that first do not wait until <laughs> you have, um, you know, more experiences to be critical. Be critical from now on because you have to question everything, all the information that circulated around you because there are so many informations and there is no way to prove or to check the validity and so on, but be critical. That is first. The second, um, do whatever we can to contribute to this world, either through um, opinion, actions, research, citizen science research, you know, so that's also counted. Um, do whatever you can. Um, some people are asking, which one should we do first? Um, climate change campaign or become activists of plastic? Or It's all depends on you. So if you want to focus all your energy or your time, pick one or two or three. <laughs> I like multitasking, so I, I have um, various uh, levels of interest. And lastly, please remind the Yeah. Please remind the producers that things that cannot be recycled should not be manufactured or should not be made. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you very much, Yuyun. Uh, You're welcome. Sirine? Yes. And following on from that, uh, just to make the connection between big plastic and the waste disposal industry, right? The reason why we hear uh, the American Chemistry Council and other uh, organizations that represent oil producers and plastic producers defend incineration, defend something you might have heard, chemical recycling, which is actually taking plastic waste and burning it in different conditions with more or less oxygen to transform it into a fuel or a gas that you will then burn. The reason why they support these technologies is because they destroy the plastic and they keep the demand. They want to keep producing. They want to produce more plastics than they ever have before because they know that they'll have a hard time selling their oil and gas for energy because they're going to renewables. And the point is, if you care about the climate, if we want to tackle this climate emergency, if we want to tackle the health emergency that we have, uh, toxic pollution, there is no other solution than reducing. That's what you can do. That's what I try to do at my level, you know, and, and, and don't hold yourself to impossible standards. Don't feel that you have to eliminate everything. Whatever step you can take and connect with your community around is good. And, and, um, and connect that to a, to a systemic effort, to a movement, uh, your own network, uh, the brand artist with Break Free From Plastic, you might have seen the iconic image of the Greenpeace uh, diver uh, holding a, a Coke bottle uh, underwater with a, with a sign that says, Coke, is this yours, right? So we have great potential there to communicate on, on social media platforms. Um, and just to, to, to come back, I think what we've learned through COVID and what we've learned with Black Lives Matter is that everything's connected and, and our communities are connected and what happens in, our, in one community impacts another one. And we have to make these connections if we want to change, if we want things to change. Otherwise, we're just deluding ourselves. When incinerators are built, they are placed in black communities and in indigenous communities and communities of color. And they just, it's just another layer of oppression that comes there. And, and, and so, so that's why, uh, you know, that, that's the connection that we see in our work with, with you know, ocean health and, and, and the kind of work that you folks are doing day to day. Uh, and so, you know, thank you for this opportunity to, to connect. Uh, and I hope, we, I hope we can work together in the future. No, thank you very much for, for your experience, because I think that I couldn't have said it before <laughs> uh, uh, better. So I'm, I'm very happy that you made time for, for speaking to our ocean leaders. And yeah, remember that we all not have the same possibilities that we are not, have, we are not able to, to make the solutions in the same way. Just do whatever it's within our hands. Uh, we are not all privileged. I consider myself super privileged to be able to say I can buy a clean canteen or whatever. Uh, so thank you very much for, for all your support. And yeah, let's keep uh, having more 
sense uh, through all the webinars that are coming in the next weeks. Uh, Ron, would you like to, to add something? Uh, no, I, I don't think I should talk anymore because Serene has really left us on a, on a great, <laughs> great point. Uh, just to stay tuned for the rest of the series. Uh, up next will be on September 23rd, we're going to do a series, uh, the webinar will be called Research It. So we will feature a bunch of different researchers from around the world who are looking at all angles of how we understand where is plastic, where is it ending up, and, and what's, what's going on there. So stay tuned and uh, thank you very much everybody for joining. Thank you very much. Have a great day or night or evening. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right, thanks.